On this Wednesday night, the date is set. Legal pot is coming, but is Canada ready? Just under four months to go, there are a lot of concerns from the provinces to the police and healthcare workers. We look at all of those angles and hear some of your concerns. Also tonight, a dramatic reversal from the U.S. president. The White House caves to historic pressure and vows to stop separating families at the border. But what happens to the 2,300 kids who've already been taken from their parents? This is The National. It's a law that will have profound effects on Canadian society, from the economy to law enforcement to the health care system. More than a year after it was first announced in Parliament, Canada is finally poised to make recreational marijuana legal this fall. We will soon have a new system in place, one that keeps cannabis out of the hands of our kids and keeps profits away from organized crime. Today, I'm also pleased to announce that the new recreational cannabis regime will officially come into force on October 17th of this year. That's a Wednesday, October 17th, and that happens to be exactly 17 weeks from today, when Canadians can start consuming the drug without breaking the law. In a moment, we'll take out our red chair to the streets to hear some of the concerns that you might have around legalization. And just because it will be legal doesn't necessarily mean it will be safe, so we'll explore the effects of marijuana on your health. But we begin tonight with the many questions the government will have to answer. And the CBC's Catherine Cullen has that angle to lead us off. Justin Trudeau strolled into his end of session news conference pleased to announce pot legalization will be a reality. In fact, the Liberals are fundraising off it, but it's coming months after they initially intended. The provinces have asked us for more time than they originally thought they would need in order to get the implementation right, and I think we all agree it's important to get this right uh, and not rushed. But not rushed hasn't always been the government's message. Listen to what they were saying last November to the Senate. I would simply remind them that, that the urgency of getting this work done is based on what's currently happening to our kids in our communities today and, and that the, the price of delay is unacceptable. We now know the date, but there are plenty of outstanding questions. There are concerns that Canadians could be turned away at the U.S. border for admitting to something now legal in Canada. Despite that, the government warns, tell the truth. I would recommend, strongly recommend that they answer uh, the questions honestly and uh, um, you, it's still illegal to take uh, marijuana across the border. Public Safety Minister Ralph Goodale has been talking to U.S. politicians but confirmed today there's no deal in place to ease border concerns. There's also been some conflict over growing pot at home. The federal law says Canadians can grow up to four plants per household, but Manitoba and Quebec intend to ban the practice. So whose law do citizens have to follow? Quebec's premier says his. But we are convinced that we have full jurisdiction to regulate. But Ottawa isn't being quite so clear. Which law do you expect people to follow? Well, I, I, again, uh, provinces can set their own laws. Uh, if uh, individuals are challenging that law, they can, or if have a problem with that law, they can challenge it. The federal government just today passed a law to get tougher on drug impaired driving, but it's harder to measure pot impairment than drunk driving. And court challenges seem inevitable. And there are still questions about which tools police will use to detect impairment, as well as the training to use them. Then there's the question of pardons. Canadians who have a criminal record for something that will no longer be considered a crime, like possession of a small amount of marijuana. The government says consideration of that will have to wait, but right now the focus is on preparing for October 17th. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. According to Stats Canada, about one in seven Canadians already use cannabis, and many view pot as relatively harmless. But is that backed up by science? Our Christine Birak looks at the questions that doctors still have on how marijuana affects your health. It's not even that I really liked the effect of it, but just the community of it, the giggling, and the fact that it was that I actually felt like I was a part of something for the first time. A sense of belonging. At 15, it meant everything. By the time high school was over, Vanessa Markov and her friends were smoking pot every day. As a kid, I absolutely didn't think it was addictive. 
because no one had ever talked about it being addictive. Fifteen years later, she found herself in a doctor's office pleading for help with multiple mental health issues. I just started to have extreme panic attacks. Um, I had very high anxiety, brutal social anxiety, to the point where I had to be either drunk or high in order to really relate to people or feel comfortable in my own skin. When she tried to cut back on cannabis, that's when Markov realized she couldn't do it. Contrary to popular belief, it's estimated 9% of cannabis users will develop an addiction or dependency, which is less than alcohol and nicotine. But for those who start toking as teenagers, it's about 17%. And while they may think pot eases their stress and anxiety, think again. These are people at risk for psychosis. So Regular cannabis use can rewire the brain, which is still developing until the age of 25. Near daily use has been associated with a higher risk of suicide, depression and anxiety disorders. We understand little about everything. We do understand enough to say that young people should not use cannabis. Researchers still have a lot of questions, but they found for some, and they're not sure how many, marijuana increases the risk of developing mental illness, including psychosis and schizophrenia. I would love to go to a party and tell, yes, you can use, no, you can't, yes, you can, no, you can't. We are not there yet. We don't know who can use and will have no trouble versus some people, some very young people who are actually going to become very sick. For Canadians young and old, frequent users or not, driving while stoned is also a serious concern. In the long and short term, marijuana can harm memory, concentration and decision-making skills. Driving high doubles the risk of being in a collision, and yet... We're learning that there's a lot of misperceptions about uh, drug-impaired driving, and um, a lot of Canadians feel that they are better drivers when they're under the influence of cannabis. A recent Health Canada survey found students don't think smoking cannabis is as risky as they once did. In 2014, 25% of students said smoking cannabis once in a while was a great risk. Two years later, it was down to 17%. As a society, we need to become better educated about what the effects of cannabis are. And I think if you have that knowledge, it's going to be less daunting to have these conversations uh, with young people. Markov admits she probably wouldn't have listened to anyone's advice, but she regrets spending more than a decade of her life in a drug-induced haze. I was extremely lethargic. I went from being an athlete to being a couch potato. It took her six months to break her cannabis habit, but three years later, she welcomes legalization. I'm totally for it because I think it's time for people to stop arguing over whether or not users are criminals and start looking at the resources and the help for people who do have a problem with it. Markov has learned the hard way. For her, marijuana isn't a harmless cure-all. She hopes others can avoid making the same mistakes. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. So, there's a lot of issues there are still left to tackle, and we know that many Canadians, many of you, might have your own concerns. So, we set up our red chair, we invited people to sit down and to share their perspectives. <laughs> Marijuana will soon be legal in Canada. Will I get high? No, I will not. No, smoking makes my life insurance too expensive. I'm concerned about the smell everywhere, pretty much. It puts me off, um, and too many crazy people around. Well, my parents are a bit concerned about it. They've warned me about brain development, how it can possibly slow down, for example, your memory, your um, learning abilities. But they've told me as long as you do it once in a while with some friends at a party, it's okay. My concern with the legalization of marijuana is people getting high and driving. It's a huge concern for me. I know people that do use marijuana currently and, and do it and then go home and drive. No, I don't have any concerns or worries. I think it's, it's been proven safer than drinking alcohol, so I, they should have done this a long time ago. I'll get high, but I'll tell you, I, I don't know about these edibles, because they're gonna make them look like jelly beans and chocolate bars, and a lot of kids like jelly beans and chocolate bars. You know, like, uh, 
Ma leaves her stash out on the table one night because she's too high. Little Junior gets up in the morning, grabs a handful of jelly beans. Where's he going? He's getting high. My concern is uh, organizations or organized crime that currently sells marijuana will move on to harder drugs. And I want to know if we have a plan to contain that because we haven't done a good job at containing uh, marijuana distribution, even though it was illegal. I have used marijuana for the last 50 years. I'm okay. They didn't have to legalize it for me to get high. There we go. <laughs> A friendly reminder, still illegal <laughs> until October 17th. With Canada, though, lifting that 95-year-old prohibition on cannabis, we will now be actually the only second country in the world where the drug is legal nationwide. The first, the South American nation of Uruguay. It fully legalized the personal use of pot four years ago. And you'd be forgiven for thinking, I did, that marijuana is already legal in the Netherlands. No, we're wrong. Amsterdam's one of the world's most popular tourism destinations for pot smokers. But the drug actually remains illegal there. Rather, it is simply tolerated and users won't be jailed, just like it is in a handful of other countries in Europe. So what about our neighbors to the south? They're a little bit concerned. Well, nine states and the District of Columbia have given the green light to legal recreational weed. Lots to think about there. And as Canada is entering uncharted territory, the U.S. is tonight pulling back from the edge, Andrew. Yeah, Rosie, for days the White House has been dealing with two problems, public outrage and political pressure. And today that combination led to a stunning reversal. Donald Trump agreeing today to end a policy allowing children of illegal immigrants to be taken away from their parents. But what about all those kids already on their own, waiting in so-called shelters, their parents in jail? We'll look at what happens to them in a moment. We start, though, in Washington, where we saw a dramatic retreat from the White House. But as CBC's Paul Hunter tells us, Trump insists there's still zero tolerance for breaking American immigration laws. You're going to have a lot of happy people. With those words and that ink, Donald Trump today took the rare step of backing down. He undid a problem he himself created, even as he took credit for his own reversal. So we're keeping families together, and this will solve that problem. The problem? All those migrants accused of crossing into the U.S. illegally detained in cages. And if they came with children, the children were taken from them. Such family separation sparked a huge outcry in this country. Let the children go now! With emotional pleadings for Trump to back down on the policy that brought it on. The families were separated because of his decision to criminally prosecute all alleged illegal crossers. Zero tolerance. Under U.S. law, parents facing such prosecution cannot stay with their kids. Trump had long insisted only Congress could reverse all that. Today... He did it himself, as critics had long insisted he could. So we're going to have strong, very strong borders, but we're going to keep the families together. Trump is directing that the rules be changed, governing how long children can be detained, allowing the families to stay together. Meanwhile, he's also directing the U.S. Defense Department to now provide further accommodation for families through whatever legal proceedings follow their capture. Trump today also urged U.S. lawmakers to quickly pass broad immigration reform, which, by the way, would also include money for Trump's long-promised but still unbuilt border wall, something Democrats strongly oppose. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll get the wall. We'll get the wall done. We'll get the wall done, yes? Bottom line, U.S. authorities will keep on prosecuting everyone they catch. But if Trump's order holds, children will no longer be taken from their parents. In the face of all that outrage, Trump blinked. But, Paul, you say if the order holds. Is there a chance it might not? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Um, you know, for sure, the order could be challenged. Uh, the key part of the rules for these children has been that they're allowed to be held in those detention centers for at most 20 days. The idea is that any longer than that in those places isn't good for children. Now, Trump is saying, in effect, okay, 
So instead, we'll keep families together, but it'll have to be in detention, and it'll likely be for more than 20 days. So if his order is challenged, the ultimate question may well be what's better for the children? To be taken from their parents and cared for by someone else, but in some place that isn't one of those detention centers? Or is it better to keep them in one of those awful places we've seen for who knows how long, but with their parents? That's where zero tolerance ultimately leads. Andrew. Paul Hunter in Washington. Thanks very much. So, uh, look, there are a number of questions still unanswered about what this executive order will mean. But perhaps the most pressing one, what about the 2,000-plus kids who've already been separated from their parents? For most of those 2,300 kids, the first stop after being separated was somewhere like this. Then they'd be taken to one of many children's shelters, often in another state. Yes, they are well-fed and protected there, but most have no idea where their parents are. And when it comes to finding them again, have a listen to lawyer Anthony Enriquez. He's worked with children who've been separated from their parents, and he says the U.S. government has no plan at all. No, there is no plan. There is no plan that's been set forth. There uh, are no instructions that have come to any caseworkers or legal service providers that are working with these families to help facilitate that reunification. Even so, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services says it will reunite families eventually. It just didn't offer up much in the way of details. We are always working aggressively. We need to get the children out of our care as expeditiously, expeditiously as possible. And consider how difficult it may be to reunite separated families, whether it's a lack of documents, parents being moved from one detention center to another, or even deported. And younger children may lack the language skills or the knowledge to help find their parents at all. Children who can't be, be reunited with their family uh, are unaccompanied minors then. There is no adult uh, who will assume care or custody of that child here in the United States. Then there's the issue of emotional and psychological damage. Kids who don't know when or if they'll see their families again. And separating parents and children is absolutely devastating. It's very harmful both for the short term and in terms of its long term effects. On, even on the neurodevelopment of children and can result in impairment of their social, emotional, and cognitive functioning. And even if families are reunited again, there is another larger question to consider. Will all of this actually stem the tide of illegal border crossers, or will they just keep coming? Now, Barack Obama doesn't tend to weigh in on Trump's policies much, but he did post a message on Facebook today, which also happens to be World Refugee Day. In it, he asks, are we a nation that accepts the cruelty of ripping children from their parents' arms, or are we a nation that values families and works to keep them together? He goes on to say, we have to do more than say this isn't who we are. We have to prove it through our policies, our laws, our actions, and our votes. Okay, lots more we're keeping tabs on tonight, including what the Prime Minister said about his relationship with Donald Trump. Justin Trudeau was asked today what he made of Trump's personal attacks, calling him dishonest and weak in a tweet after the G7 summit. His answer. Look, I'm, uh, I think uh, as, uh, as politicians, we develop a certain amount of uh, uh, thick skins, uh, and uh, I stay focused on what we need to do to uh, advance the common causes we have, and I'm not going to uh, react to, uh, to, uh, you know, to personal comments. Trudeau added he has not spoken directly with Trump since the G7 summit, and the next time he does expect to see him will be in three weeks at the NATO summit in Brussels. And when you look at the recent tension between the two leaders, a key part of it were those U.S. tariffs slapped on Canadian aluminum and steel. You'll recall, to justify them, the U.S. said Canadian imports posed a national security threat, and also that the U.S. had a trade deficit with Canada on steel. But today, the U.S. Commerce Secretary acknowledged that's not actually true. What is it about the Canadian steel industry that is a national security interest to the, uh, threat to the United States? Oh, the... the uh, Canadian steel industry is not being accused of directly and individually being a security threat. What, what is our trade deficit we, in steel with Canada? We, we don't have a trade deficit. We, of no, in, we don't? No, sir. Well, do we have a surplus with Canada yes, in steel? Sir. 
So you've got to figure those were encouraging words for Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister, Christia Freeland. Her team has been insisting from the very beginning Canadian steel does not pose a security threat to the United States. Another developing story we're following tonight, sexual misconduct allegations against prominent Ontario winemaker Norman Hardy. He issued a statement today in response to a Globe and Mail report. It detailed accusations from three women of unwanted sexual contact and of inappropriate behaviour by more than a dozen others. In a statement, Hardy denied some of the allegations but said many others were true. And, he said, to all those who felt marginalized, demeaned or objectified while working for or alongside me, I'm truly very sorry. Hardy also said he's been working to change his behaviour. Ahead tonight on The National, we'll take you on board Canada's newest bare-bones airline. Will Swoop succeed where so many others have failed? And later, Duncan McHugh sits down with three leading voices in Indigenous cinema for The National in conversation. What they say about the impact of a new wave in Indigenous film in this country. First, though, the key piece of evidence that could have prevented a Canadian from spending years in a French prison without a charge. We had no inkling. I mean, we were blown away. It's almost inconceivable that something that important would not be in the file. CBC News has uncovered troubling details about the investigation into a deadly attack in Paris almost four decades ago, a case which saw this Canadian man spend more than three years in a French prison without charge. David Cochran has been digging into this story and has new information for us tonight. David, tell us what you found out. Well, Rosie, for the second time in the Hassan Diab case, we've learned that key fingerprint evidence that could have helped clear his name was never shared with Diab, his lawyer, or with the Canadian courts. In fact, in this case, the evidence wasn't even shared with Canada. France had the fingerprint evidence in its files, but it told Canada no fingerprints existed. We had no inkling. I mean, we were blown away. Don Bain had been representing Hassan Diab for nearly 10 years before he learned about the fingerprint. It was found on a hotel registration card that French prosecutors say was filled out by the man behind this 1980 bombing outside a Paris synagogue that killed four and injured more than 40. The French say this was the work of Hassan Diab, a university lecturer living in Ottawa. In its request to have Diab extradited to France, investigators stated that police checked the hotel registration form for prints, but did not discover any usable fingerprint traces. This was December 2008. It's untrue, and provably untrue. Court documents obtained by CBC News show that France was able to find a usable fingerprint on the hotel form. This was in May 2007. 19 months before the extradition request was made. Big mouth. Comparisons with Diab's prints were negative. This is all spelled out in the decision by the French courts to set Diab free. The judges cited the lack of fingerprints linking Diab to the bombing as a key reason for letting him go. It's almost inconceivable that something that important would not be in the file. Under Canada's extradition laws, France wasn't required to disclose all of the evidence it had on Diab or disclose any evidence that pointed to his innocence. But the submissions it makes to the Canadian court has to be certified as truthful, stating that evidence doesn't even exist falls short of that standard. France's Ministry of Justice had no comment when contacted by CBC News. France has appealed Diab's release. Canada's Department of Justice acted on France's behalf during the extradition process, but Canadian lawyers had no way to know about the 2007 fingerprint sample. In a statement, the department said, we cannot speculate about what France may or may not have done, nor can we comment on what the hypothetical effect of documents contained in the French investigative file could have been on extradition proceedings, which have now concluded. Okay, so David, the Justice Department is doing an internal review of this case, in part because of some of your reporting, but there are also now concerns about that review. 
Yeah, the issue is that the senior official running that review played a role in the original extradition of Hassan Diab. Her name is Jacqueline Palumbo, and she wrote at least one memo about Diab to Rob Nicholson, who was the justice minister of the time who ordered Diab extradited to France. And Diab's lawyer, Don Bain, says this is a conflict of interest that undermines the credibility of this internal process. The Justice Department is defending her appointment and pointing out that this is only one part of the examination they're going to do of what happened to Hassan Diab. They are promising an external review, but at this point, we don't know who's going to do it, what the terms of reference are, and when it will be done. And what Diab and his supporters want, Rosie, is a public inquiry led by a judge. Okay, David, thanks for this. You got it. We asked the Prime Minister about Diab's call for a public inquiry. Here's what he said. I think for uh, uh, Hassan Diab, we have to recognize, first of all, that uh, what happened to him never should have happened. Uh, this is uh, something that obviously was an extremely difficult uh, uh, situation to go through for himself, for his family. Uh, and that's why we've asked for an independent external review uh, to look into exactly uh, how this happened and make sure that it never happens again. Final note on this story, Hassan Diab says he has no plans to sue Ottawa for compensation over his case. He just wants a change to the extradition laws so, so that what happened to him doesn't happen to anyone else. And up next on The National, there's a new airline in Canada, and it's promising ultra-low prices, but how much will a flight really cost you? This is ultra bare bones. You as a consumer will be, if I, could, I, I can use the term, nickeled and dimed. Well, the logo is brash and loud, but that's kind of the point for Swoop. Its owner, WestJet, wants to grab your attention. It's the newest ultra-low-cost airline on the block. The promise, ticket prices up to 40% less than other carriers. But Swoop is entering a sector that's been tough to crack. And as Jacqueline Hansen shows us, customers will get precisely what they pay for. Swoop's first flight was out of Hamilton, where airport fees are less expensive. One way it's trying to make fares as cheap as possible. The whole idea is it's bringing down the cost of air travel, making it more affordable for more Canadians to travel. Swoop's fares include a seat, but that's about it. If you don't want to eat and you don't want to check in baggage and so forth, you don't have to spend that. It's plane seats 189 people with no room to spare. It gets a little bit tied up here, so that's the reason why we charge, because there's marginal space. Passengers can bring one personal item, like a purse, for free, but a carry-on bag costs between $36 and $92. This is ultra bare bones. You, as a consumer, will be, if I, could, I, I can use the term, nickeled and dimed. Budget airlines like Tango, Greyhound Air and Roots Air tried and failed to conquer Canada's skies. Operating in a country this big isn't cheap and foreign ownership rules have limited investment here. Still, startups keep trying. Flair Air already offers low-cost fares. Jetlines is trying to get off the ground. Swoop's big advantage, it's backed by WestJet. What we've seen in the past with any startup airline, it's usually the marketing plan, the business plan, and how deep are the pockets. At Canada's busiest airport, some travelers say they'd be happy to take a different route for a deal. Because it's cheaper, you know, I mean, anything to cut prices. Especially if it's, if it's only like a two-hour flight or something like that, it's, it's not a big deal. Others aren't on board. I think it'll be too far. Too far from Toronto to go to Hamilton and then take the flight, right? I would still take into account, like, can, how much would my um, check-in luggage be and add all those um, extra charges. Swoop is hoping to expand its flights outside of Canada if Canadians go for its pitch of big savings and no frills. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Hamilton. Now, we wondered how Swoop's prices would stack up in a real-life scenario, so we tried a little comparison shopping. A Swoop flight from Hamilton to Halifax this Saturday costs 239 bucks. But let's say you choose your seat in advance, you check one bag, and you bring a carry-on with you. Not unusual. Now you're at $318. Compare that to a similar Air Canada flight, this one flying out of Toronto, heading to Halifax. Same features, and you're looking at $396. The difference, about 78 bucks. It's not a perfect comparison, but you get the idea. And Swoop's parent company, WestJet, was about the same, at $391. 
Straight ahead on The National, you'll hear from three leaders in Indigenous film as they reflect on the past and give their hopes for the future. The National in Conversation is next. What's your name? Saul. Well, you speak English very good. My father taught me. And he gave you a fine biblical name. A scene from Indian Horse, the groundbreaking Canadian movie released in April about an Indigenous boy forced into a residential school who found some solace in hockey. The award-winning drama not only spotlighted a controversial chapter in this country's history, but it touched off another debate about the portrayal and involvement of First Nations, Métis and Inuit, in the movies that we see. On the eve of National Indigenous Peoples Day, our Duncan McHugh sat down for a conversation with three major players in Indigenous filmmaking. much for joining us. I want to start with a really old question. Uh, let's call it the dances with wolves uh, question. Lisa, let's start with you. Do, do films about indigenous people need to be made by community or is it good enough to just have indigenous content out there in the theaters? Well, uh, that's an easy answer. Indigenous films need to be made by indigenous people and I'll tell you why. So Dances with Wolves is a great ex uh, an example where when that came out, I think that because the portrayal of Indians in that movie wasn't the horrifying portrayal that had been seen for so many years, even though it was a white man coming to save the indigenous people and there's really problematic things about that movie, indigenous people were so happy to see themselves for once, not portrayed as murderous, oversimplified, that they flocked to that movie. But that was a long time ago and now, in 2018, we have a huge number of Indigenous filmmakers and we have much more complex stories that we can tell. And so I think the era of the Dances with Wolves is thankfully behind us at this point. Uh, you hear in Indigenous literature right now, uh, nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. Is that something you agree with when it comes to film? I totally agree. I, you know, films have been made about Indigenous people for a century now and uh, when the general public knows so little about our cultures because it hasn't been taught in our education system. We're at a point now that so many films have been made about us without us that they're just telling the same story over and over again. And even just from a storytelling perspective, to have more interesting stories, it makes sense to have Indigenous people telling Indigenous stories. It, couldn't the point be made, though, that, that it's part of reconciliation to have non-Indigenous directors, non-Indigenous film crews telling Indigenous stories? Jesse? No. Um, uh, I, I would just say, Duncan, um, there's no such, th nothing can be an indigenous film unless it was made by indigenous people. So, nothing? No. Why? Because then it's not indigenous. Isn't it important though to have the content, uh, take a, a film, a movie like Indian Horse, uh, which, which was written by an indigenous author but had a primarily non-indigenous crew but is screening right across Canada right now. People are talking about residential schools. Isn't that important? The, the, sure, the story's important but let's also think of who gets enriched by that, who gets to have careers and who gets furthered. And when American filmmakers go to say France and make a movie in France with French people, do we call it a French film? No, we do not. We call it an American movie set in France. Um, the authorship of cinema is dictated by who the creators are, not who is on screen. And that means that throughout history, 99% of all movies about Indigenous people have not been made by us, and we, we deserve that opportunity as much as anyone else. There is right now going on, uh, call it a resurgence, uh, call it the next wave of Indigenous cinema. What are the barriers for, for Indigenous filmmakers right now in terms of trying to get into the, the market? 
Well, I mean, filmmaking's expensive, say, versus writing a book or writing poems or painting a picture. So whenever you have a high barrier to entry, as in you need a lot of money to make this product, you get institutional ceilings where people who have not been in the mainstream, who have not had the access to power, not had the access to funding, not had all the personal connections through the way that they grew up, people who are on the outside of that over culture are reaching these ceilings where, okay, you might get an Arts Council grant, make a short film. But as soon as we get into the features, the TV series, which are actually the modes by which a lot of Canadians are seeing our media, we are kept out. Indigenous folks are kept out of that. So I think that uh, a lot of the conversation right now is looking at, hey, within this realm that we've had access to funding, we've been able to make our films. Indigenous creatives have made award-winning films that have been screened across the world. And so what's happened is we've noticed that there's a, there's a level at which we need to step above, and that means institutions coming on board to support our storytelling voices. When you're trying to pitch Inuit content, what's it like, who are you pitching to, and what kind of reception are you getting? Well, I've been at this about 15 years now, and I don't know how many times I've been told, oh, we're already doing a native story this year. So that's, that's a barrier. Um, the fact that we're, we're like a spice just sprinkled throughout, we can't be uh, the meat of television. Um, I was really inspired by seeing one of, I can't remember the, the, the pro producer's name, um, an Asian American actor saying, how come there can be things, uh, you know, Italian mafia movies for decades and decades and people know so much about Italian culture, how come we can't have the same thing for uh, people of Asian descent or indigenous descent? So it's, uh, it's not an excuse anymore to say you've already done a native story this year. And, and to further the, Alicia's point, if we think of one of the greatest American movies ever made, The Godfather, mm -hmm. they hired an Italian-American to tell that story, very purposefully. And I would suggest the movie is significantly better for that connection, and I think we need the same here. But I would also point out, Duncan, that most of the major cultural institutions, the funders in this country, were founded at a time when it was illegal for indigenous peoples to tell their stories on this land, including the CBC, where we speak today. And so um, that is a legacy that, that the, our community has to deal with on an ongoing basis. And so, for example, even the CBC, when it introduced their latest schedule of shows, there are more shows about indigenous people made by non-indigenous people than there are shows made by indigenous people in that lineup. That is an ongoing issue um, that, we, that we require and need to overcome if we ever expect to actually get indigenous stories any sort of space on screens. How much of it, though, Jesse, is going to be getting Canadian bums in the seats of theaters to watch the product of indigenous filmmakers? I mean, how much of it is going to, to, to require that Canadians want to hear these stories if indigenous filmmakers are, are going to... to well, I would, I would say that's a question that should be posed to all Canadian filmmakers, because that's not just an issue for indigenous filmmakers. We have an issue with all Canadian films and how Canadians view them. I would also suggest bums in seats may not be the measure by which we judge the success of films going forward. Um, there's many, many different ways for people to view movies, all sorts of screen content nowadays. I would suggest some of the more impactful shows in recent years haven't been about being bums in seats, about getting eyeballs on screens wherever they may be. So I think we also have to look at how we're judging success of these shows, but I think it also becomes a circular argument, one that the industry has relied on for years, which says indigenous stories don't draw audiences, so we don't make indigenous stories. Well, why not try making some on the scale that we make the other yeah. stories, and try that for a while, and then come back and tell us that that doesn't actually work? Because my suspicion is it will work just fine if given the same opportunity that so many others have had in Canada to tell their stories on screens. Take a film like Atanarjuat, which, which was monumental for indigenous cinema in Canada, won at Cannes. What kind of impact did that have for, for the, the Inuit narrative and, and relationship to Canada, do you think? It's huge. I mean, as a filmmaker, it was a huge inspiration to me, but also just as an Inuk, you know, I, I clearly have traditional tattoos, and when I was researching traditional tattoos at the time, so many, even Inuit, had no idea that they existed. And then Atan came out, and suddenly everyone knew what Inuit traditional tattoos looked like. So that was a really powerful experience for me, that film coming out as an Inuk, uh, uh, when it comes to Inuit identity, but also as a filmmaker. Nobody could say anymore that, uh, 
you know, back to the bums in seats question, um, <laughs> at the Nato, it's one of the most popular Canadian film of all time. It's just not an argument that these films can't be successful and brilliant. Uh, the last question for you, Jesse. I mean, it seems that, that Indigenous filmmakers not only have to entertain people, but they also have to be political. They also have to educate Canadians. Uh, are we going to get to a time where an Indigenous filmmaker can just do a rom-com and, and just purely entertain someone? Yes, uh, I think so. But I think um, often the art that cre is created by Indigenous artists is reflexive, reflective of the obligation they feel to serve all of those things. And so I think that's not unnatural. And we shouldn't, um, it's OK that Indigenous cinema uh, does that. And because ultimately, Duncan, for me, this is about us being human. And Canada has a real struggle with seeing Indigenous people as human. And that's one of the legacies of having people that aren't us tell our stories for so long. And there are real pressing issues in our communities that require Canada to see us as human if they are ever going to be addressed. And art is one pathway to create those human connections. And so to me, this isn't just about these incredibly talented artists and telling our stories on screens. It's the connection that getting those stories on screens and into Canadian homes will mean for the real life issues, the life and death issues our communities are facing right now. And maybe that can contribute to actually solving those in the long term and find a new Canada uh, that tells different stories about itself and about the people that live here uh, and move forward in a more human way. Uh, Miigwech, thank you so much for joining us and thanks for sharing your stories. Miigwech. Canada's National Film Board says it has made some gains in fostering Indigenous talent, but it admits there's also more work to be done. The board has backed 35 Indigenous-led projects in the first year of its Indigenous Action Plan. They represent 10 percent of overall production spending. The three-year blueprint has a target of 15 percent by 2020. In total, the board's action plan contains 33 commitments in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report of 2015. And remember, you can get more of The National in your inbox every afternoon. The National Today takes a closer look at several big stories. Today, that included the World Cup's surprise guest, the now banned former FIFA president, Sepp Blatter. You can subscribe to our newsletter at cbcnews.ca slash the national. these cup breakfast cupcakes. I was like, excuse me, this is very sandy. And I asked them, what do you put in it? And you know what they said to me? Sand. He was here last night, wandering around as usual. What are you doing? That outfit's always going to get you noticed. I'm not sure all policemen would be so observant. The block of woods over there. So I asked it, what do you want to be? I touched it, and I closed my eyes, and poof. Oh, she's still a very handsome woman, and soon to be a very rich widow. Do you have what it takes to become Canada's first ever smartest person junior? Show us what kind of smart you are. Apply now at cbc.ca slash smartest person junior. She was very nice to the residents. Um, she was very nice to me, to staff. Tonight on The National, one of the former bosses of a serial killer explains why she never reported any concerns about her performance to the Ontario College of Nurses. Melanie Smith was co-director of the Meadow Park Care Home, the last place Elizabeth Wetlofer is known to have killed someone in her care. Smith told an inquiry today she didn't have any concerns about her nursing skills, and when she learned of her drug and alcohol issues, didn't think she needed to report it because she didn't think it had affected Wetlofer's ability to do her job. I call to move the motion the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, Secretary David Davis. Yeah. Also, relief today for British Prime Minister Theresa May. After months of debate, the UK's upper house of parliament has passed her flagship Brexit bill. It has been considered a critical win for the government as it prepares for Britain's exit from the European Union. The next step is for the legislation to receive royal assent and become law, which should happen in the coming weeks. I am honoured to accept this award on behalf of Darcy, but not because of what happened to him on April 6, 2018, but because of what he did every day before April 6. To and tonight in Las Vegas, the humbled Broncos were honored at the NHL Awards. Christina Hogan accepted the first Community Hero Award on behalf of her husband, Broncos coach Darcy Hogan.
He died in the team's horrific bus crash on April 6th. The NHL Foundation is making a donation to the Saskatchewan Brain Injury Association in his memory. Well, this week marks the end of an era beneath the streets of Montreal. The city's last original metro car is retiring after 52 years in service. But before it takes its final victory lap, we caught up with someone who's been at the controls for decades. And that is our moment of the day. Mark Labonte even put on an old vintage uniform, guiding an MR63 through the city's underground a few more times before they disappear altogether. A little bit of uh, nostalgia, you know, you know what I mean? But it was a really good train, really good. It may seem old-fashioned now. Du premier train. But back when the Metro first opened, these trains were considered cutting edge. For starters, they had rubber wheels instead of the usual steel on steel, making for one of the world's smoothest rides. And while the trains have been upgraded over the years, they've been showing their age. Well, I'm a bit the jerks. <laughs> the... Oh, that, because I'm yet turn, don't have that. For these commuters taking one last ride down memory lane, it's all part of the charm. Most of my uh, childhood was riding on these uh, on these trains. It's part of my Montreal memory, so I feel like it's kind of so sad. The old train's final run is tomorrow. OK, so they're not going to be just, like, tossed, because they are sort of <laughs> iconic Montreal symbols. Uh, there are seven projects that have been chosen, and, and people are going to do various art things with them. There's a couple of brothers that are going to build in some way, I don't understand, stack them to make them into a cafe and an art gallery. and. Yeah, so they'll, they'll, they'll be reused and recycled. Now, I didn't, I've never lived there. Uh, everyone <laughs> thinks I did, but I didn't. And you were the host of CBC in Montreal, so you've obviously been on these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I lived in Montreal for 10 years. And I'll say, just, you know, on the future of the metro cars, clearly the possibilities are endless, right? They could come yeah. up with any number yeah. of things. But I, I don't know. I, I, I guess on a personal level, I, I don't know if I have any particular attachment to the cars themselves. I, I think I was mostly happy just to see the kind of newer, upgraded ones. But I will say, you know, sometimes... As human beings, we process things in funny ways. And watching that video does make me kind of oh, feel in a warm a and fuzzy way. <laughs> you know, uh, I had some good times in Montreal, and that reminds me Aww, of that. So, hey, we'll nice. leave it there. Uh, that's The National for this June 20th. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a good night. Good night.